of red light therapy. Garbage. Garbage. <laughs> yeah. Well, Doctor Doctor Uberman is uh, starting to. He, he, it's good for the eyes. I seen him put something out about that. Yeah. Really so I should I should I should backtrack that. It's good for some things. Like it's supposed to be really good for your skin, scar healing, that kind of stuff. Other than that, like, do I think the lights like penetrating four centimeters deep into your tendons and everything? Like, I, I don't know. The verdict's out on that one. What's going on, guys? This is Chris Wyvin. I appreciate you guys checking out my channel and the latest episode of my podcast, Won't Back Down. I have a great show planned for today, but before we begin, I want to tell you about my show's presenting sponsor, BioAccelerator. BioAccelerator is the world leader in stem cell therapy and regenerative medical research. Through the use of their powerful golden stem cells, they help patients heal from joint and orthopedic injuries, autoimmune disorders, spine and disc damage, and neurological trauma. I went down to Medellin, in Colombia, and I got my stem cells, and honestly, I feel great. My leg is improving every single day, and it takes about six months to get full effect from the stem cells, and I'm really excited to see uh, what happens in the future. Uh, thanks again to BioAccelerator for helping sponsor this show and create my show, Won't Back Down, which is also available on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here with my guy, Jonathan Amato, the physical therapist to the stars, a.k.a. <laughs> Chris Weidman, and also some others like Kevin James and uh, Aljamain Sterling. And and I'm not going to go through the whole damn list because I know I'm going to miss everybody. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, big A lot list. of important people, but you got a lot. You got a big list of, of people. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you doing the show, man. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. No problem. No problem. Um, so let's start with how did you – what made you even – Get into physical therapy in the first uh, first place. Uh, it's a sort of long story, but um, it was like a natural progression, kind of like my whole life. Um, I've always been involved in like sports and health and fitness and that kind of stuff. Um, I was a phys ed teacher first. Um, I taught phys ed at a school in Bushwick, Brooklyn, in two thousand four ish, and at the time I was playing for. Um, Is that the, when you just wanted to? That's when you wanted to get out of that job quick. Teaching in Bushwick, Brooklyn. <laughs> pretty Brooklyn. much. It kind of ruined it for me. I did like a year as a leave replacement on Long Island at Sachem. And then, you know, they promised me a job and it never really came through. So I got a job teaching the city. And uh, I was playing for the uh, Super League team in New York. There's a rugby team called New York Old Blue. And one of our sponsors was a gym slash um, PT clinic. So, like, the sponsorship for our team was we got to work out there for free. <clears throat> and then I was there like every day after school, like 2 30. And uh, the owner one day, you know, he's like, you know, what do you do for a living? I know rugby doesn't pay you all that well, which, you know, it didn't. It was the equivalent of pro back then, but we didn't get paid. And uh, he's like, you seem like, you know, what you're doing. Why don't you take your CSCS for your training license and then, you know, come work for me part time. So I did. I was his aide. Um, like what is the CSC? What is C What is the CSCS? You said? Yeah, CSCS. That, that is say? a uh, it's certified strength and conditioning specialist. Okay. Um, through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. So there's there's probably three main governing bodies that um, certify strength and conditioning specialists and personal trainers. So you have like you have NASM, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. You have the NSCA, then like the like the IF ISSA, and then there's like thirty other like smaller ones. But those are kind of the top three. So you know, I took that licensing exam. I passed it. Started working for him part time, and within like three months of working as a therapist aide, I was like, yeah, I'm I'm quitting teaching. So I quit teaching. I was working as the uh, the owner, this guy, Gary Guerrero, for the U.S. Athletic Training Center in Midtown. He was probably, if not the best, one of the best therapists in New York. Very hands-on. You know, we had a lot of, like, high-profile clients, that kind of stuff. So I was his aide one-on-one -on -one for about four or five years. And then in the afternoon, I was a personal trainer there. So after doing that for, like, six years, I was kind of like, well, I want to open up my own place. Um, I liked the kind of business model they had. It was like a, a, a gym slash physical therapy clinic, kind of revolving door referral program. If people came in to use the gym and they got hurt, they went right to the physical therapy. And if people came in physical therapy, they got like a, a discounted membership to the gym. So I was like, oh, I kind of want to do that. But the only option I had there was to either go to business with somebody else who was a physical therapist and I'd be the kind of gym side of things, you know, and gyms kind of open and fail daily. Or the option was to go back to school and get my doctorate and become a PT. So I did that. I took like a year and a half prereqs that I missed from being a phys ed major. And then it was three and a half years of my uh, doctoral program. And here I am. That's brutal. How, I mean, what was, what was that like going back to school? Um, 
you know, while you're probably older, how old were you at this point when you yeah, started? Yeah, I, uh, I was just about to turn 30. So I was about 30 years old when I started. Um, the prereqs, I was like 28, 29, taking the prereqs. And then I finished PT school at 33. And what were you doing for money at that time? You, you just kept working for that guy? Yeah, personal training. Um, you know, I was able to make kind of make my own hours for the most part. I had probably 12 some odd clients around about throughout the day. So I was lucky because I went to Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry and it was a full time weekend program. So it was school it was Friday night from six to nine, Saturday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday, 8 to 5. So during the week, I was able to do a lot of work, personal training. I would study in between clients, that kind of stuff. I, I quit playing rugby at that time. So I kind of retired from playing rugby. So I lived more free time. And what was the deal with the rugby uh, stuff? Obviously, here in, in, in the U.S., rugby is not very big. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's so getting some steam how, now. How would you get into that? You know, I, in college, I went to SUNY Cortland. You know, in high school, I played um, football and I wrestled. And I got to college, and I was done cutting weight. Like, I went on the, the Cortland, like the, the club team for a little bit. And I was just like, yeah, I'm not cutting weight anymore. And yeah. I, I tried out for the football team. And in high school, I went to West Hampton Beach High School here on Long Island. And we played like Ironman football. Like I played – every position, every, you know, special teams, offense, defense. We had like, you know, 22 guys in the whole team. And I played center and D end at like 215 pounds. So I got to Cortland and I wanted to go walk on and they're like, Oh, what position do you play? I was like, um, I'm D end. Like, what do you weigh? I'm like, I'm like two fifteen. They're like, that guy's our D end. And he was like 298 pounds. Dude, was yeah. massive. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I did, uh, you know, I tried out and I did okay with the weight testing, but they, they wanted to redshirt me. And I was like, you know, this isn't Notre Dame. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be a tackle dummy for a D three school. Yeah. So uh, some other guy got cut at the same time. And he's like, have you ever heard of rugby? I'm like, no. He's like, there's a rugby team on campus. It's like football without pads. I was like, hey, all right, I'll try it. And it just seemed to click like, uh, you know, within the first season, I kind of just picked it up real fast. I became the, the team captain. I was the president of the club. We made the Northeast all-star game. Um, we, we won the Northeast, um, the division three Northeast championship, my uh, senior year. And then I tore my ACL and I had to have surgery. So after my senior year, I had surgery. And then I kind of got the opportunity to play for the super league side when I moved to the city, um, which is like at the time it was the highest level rugby there was here in the U S we didn't have a, like a pro league. So it was like the feeder league for the, the national team. Gotcha. And, uh, played for them for like eight years. It was great, man. I got to play in Australia for a year. I played over the country. Like, you know, our team played. Um, there was nine other Super League teams in the U.S. So there was like L.A., San Diego. There was Denver, Colorado, Boston. There was uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, to the outside. There was um, Chicago. So we got to play all over the place. And our travel and our, our, our stay was paid for. So we didn't have to pay for that out of pocket. But, you know, we didn't get paid to play. Yeah. So um, obviously me being an athlete and uh, being a – being around physical therapists um, since I'm a little kid, basically at this point, it's never stopped for me. They're, they're kind of a dime a dozen, you know, depending on where you go. It's, it's, it's very rare. I think that you find a good physical therapist and you are a very good physical therapist. Oh, I appreciate what, that, man. Thank you. What, uh, where did like, why do you think you're a good physical therapist? <laughs> Like, I don't, how did that happen? I mean, I don't, I don't think of myself that way. I, mean, I appreciate someone like you saying that. I know you've had your fair share of, uh, of PT over the years. Um, you know, I, I, nothing about me is original. I'm kind of the amalgamation of all people I've met over the years, right? So the guy, Gary Guerrero, that I met in the city was kind of like my influence to become a PT. He was an amazing manual therapist. Like the stuff he did was just like, I watched him, somebody walk in there limping into the office and they'd, they'd sprint out. Like I just to see him work on people was awesome. So I was like, I want to do that. Like I want to, I want to help people like that. And then, you know, so I over the years of watching him and kind of being his, his aid and his backup and everything, and then going through school. And then my last rotation, I got to work with my now colleague um, and boss, Mike camp, who's another amazing manual physical therapist and everything. So I learned more stuff from him. So this is the only type of PT I know. Which boss was better between them two? <laughs> uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at him in the eyes. I, I can tell right now what he's thinking. All right, I plead the fifth. <laughs> I won't answer that one. They were both, they're both like instrumental. You know, I like working with Mike now. Obviously, we, we bounce a lot of ideas off each other. And um, so it's really good. Yeah. So this is like the only style of physical therapy I know. And even, you know, when I had physical therapy for my ACL, it was kind of the same sort of thing. So when I hear horror stories of people that, go into like a mill type place and it's just everybody gets a hot pack everybody gets stim everybody gets the same four exercises whether you have an ankle sprain or a knee problem i was just i'm like how is that possible like i've, I've never even i never thought that there was anything other than what i do 
Um, yeah. So I feel like a lot of physical therapists, uh, once they get out of physical therapy school, they take what they learn there, they open up their practice, they take a loan out or whatever, and they just do what they learn in school and they don't continue to learn. They're not working on professional development development as much as they really should. Yeah. And if they do, they probably mail it in because, you know, we have to, every three years, we have to take a certain amount of continuing ed courses. So, you know, you have to take some sort of educational course, but you can like take an online cheapo, whatever thing and kind of just mail it in and get your credits. Like, you know, some people don't want to spend the money. You know, some of the courses Mike and I go to are 1200 bucks for a two day weekend course. So, you know, we're spending good money. Yeah. Um, and actually some of the stuff that we take doesn't even count towards PT CEU. So we're just taking it because we want to learn it. So yeah. you know, a lot of the manual stuff I do with you, the joint pumping and the fashion normalization, that's not normal physical therapy. Mike and I learned that from this French osteopath, Guy Boyer. So a lot of our manual isn't even, you wouldn't see anywhere else in the country because PTs just yeah. don't do what we do. I mean, I, I want to go, I want to, I want, I, I, I know you've seen the Christian McCaffrey podcast where we went through the yeah. uh, all the different modalities, physical therapy modalities, and we did yep. this, whether it's crap or not. <laughs> um, are you ready for this? I want to yeah. I want to yeah, ask you the same questions as a professional on the other side of being an athlete as the physical therapist, and what you honestly think is good and not good. And I don't know if it's a uh, conflict of interest because like insurance pays, you know, a certain amount of money for different modalities, right? Like I would, I would assume like, you know, ultrasound, you might just do some physical, physical therapists might just do because, all right, this is going to be an extra 30 bucks, you know, yeah, whatever it is. And sadly, that's, that's what it is. You know, the insurance companies kind of dictate what you're doing by what you're able to get paid for. Um, we're a little lucky in so far as half of what we do is cash based. So people pay the, you know, the cash, and then we can kind of do whatever we feel is necessary. And then the other half is a it freaking is, problem, bro. Because I think yeah. for me as an athlete, a hundred percent, like you need more time with a physical therapist than what mm -hmm. the insurance is willing to pay. And you need more out of them than what the, the insurance is going to allow you to get as far as modality wise. Yeah. yeah and, sure. uh, and so does everybody, you know, but it's just the way physical therapists get paid by the insurance companies is terrible. It is. And honestly, it's, it's, it's kind of highway robbery, you know, like I have a hundred and something K in student loan debt to the federal government, all this sort of stuff. And um, over the last 10 years, the reimbursement rate for physical therapy has gone down. Whereas the cost of living just in general for everybody else in the population has gone up, you know, probably threefold, fourfold. So, you know, it, being an in-network provider, it kind of limits you to what you're able to do for people. And like you've seen, you know, they have to see these therapists have to see four, six, eight, patients an hour in order to just to pay the bills and then they got to like tick all these boxes off to get paid for these certain modalities so we're, we're we're a little lucky is like i said we do that that cash based thing so like you can purchase a half hour one-on-one -on -one or an hour one-on-one -on -one. and then we're also contracted with our insurance companies so like they're going to pay us the same amount no matter what we do so i could do stim this bubble down we're still getting paid 60 bucks this doesn't really matter so it kind of lives us a little bit more freedom is not but, is that not exactly what's like traditional in most? Uh, it's not. Yeah, most most people do a la carte billing. So you know they'll do a unit of stim for twelve bucks and a unit of ultrasound for eight bucks and a unit of exercise for twenty bucks and let's try to tack as many things on as they can. Gotcha. All right, let's go through this. Um, cool. And and with you, I'm going to spend a little bit more time. I think with 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 some of them. Um, ultrasound garbage. Complete garbage, no matter where. Garbage. It's been shown through multiple research studies now that it does literally nothing for most injuries, except for um, like lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow or golfer's elbow, and maybe like Achilles tendonitis. But everything else, like you used it for in the past, like sprained ankles, it does nothing. All right. You heard yeah. it here. Ultrasound is crap. <laughs> um, ice baths. Love it. More so for recovery after like a hard workout than like an injury per se, but definitely like it's, I personally like ice myself overheat. I feel better in the cold. I just, I like that. Better now, what do you say to like people that like, so I have an injury and then you have swelling from that injury. Mm -hmm. The swelling is there for a reason, right? To Correct. help heal the body and protect it for a short yeah, period of time. Yeah, so you don't have as much good. mobility. Yep. So when you put ice on it to make it feel better, uh, numbing it and, you know, hopefully taking down inflammation, if that's even true. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to get rid of inflammation if it's something that's actually going to make you better? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, 
a small amount of inflammation is good. Like, you know, you roll your ankle and it, it gets a little puffy. That's actually really good. Your, your body's natural healing factors. It's growth hormone. It's insulin. So it's would you not hit that? Then do you not hit that with ice? I would like not. That. I would not unless the person is in a ton of pain. So ice is really good for pain. Pain delays nerve conduction. So it blocks your body's perception of pain. So that's typically what I use ice for unless there's like significant swelling, like your, your ankles, the size of a, a basketball. We got to get that out of there. That's too much, you know, a little puffy, a little puffy knee, like unless you're in a ton of pain, I don't really ice it. So you just kind of, how about, how about anti-inflammatories? What's your thoughts? I'm on not a fan of those either. Again, unless it's like excessive amounts of swelling, you know, if like, right. uh, we, it's called, we call pitting edema. So like if the area gets really swollen and you go to like push on it and like your fingerprint stays in there, that's a problem. You got to get that out of there. So yeah, take anti-inflammatories, take things, um, and you ice it and whatever you got to do compression wraps to get that swelling out of there. As far as pain's concerned, like something like Tylenol is your best bet. It's not anti-inflammatory. It does reduce pain. It's not going to block your body's own pain, um, and your own um, healing factors. So it's, I prefer that over like, you know, an Advil or something like that, but so like a thousand gra- a thousand is a milligrams of ibuprofen. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't do ibuprofen. I'd do Tylenol personally. Okay. Unless it's like a ton of swelling, like I said, like you got this like watermelon on your knee, and yeah, get it out of yeah. there. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, I know where you're going. I, I already know your answers on this. I think I did, but who knows? Uh, saunas. Saunas, love it. Um, again, for like the the like more like a post workout type of thing than injury. You know, like um, you get a lot of the the um hormetic effects from saunas you get the, the heat shock protein same as the cold you get the cold shock proteins a lot of like um free radical fighting type of uh, properties for it. so it's very good if you can stand it i i last about 35 seconds in a sauna but i wish i could stay more i just can't no. deal with the heat are you kidding me bro <laughs> I, I prefer a steam steam room over sauna like the dry heat just crushes me but all i need to hear is like what it actually does for you and when i heard that like when you're putting yourself in that super high stressful heat and you feel like you're gonna die your body is you're basically in survival mode. So your body starts creating all these different hormones, like growth hormone, testosterone, red blood cells to keep yourself alive. Mm-hmm. And then if you, so if you're able to withhold your, it, it withhold yourself inside that for a little bit of time, you get to walk outside that sauna with those extra hormones yeah, and, you feel and like healing a everything bucks. a little yeah. bit faster. With that, I like contrast back then. So I'll do like two minutes in the hot tub or sauna, and then I'll go to the cool, the cold plunge for two and back and forth. But that gotcha. smokes you. Like if you do that for like eight, 10 minutes, like you better have nothing else in your plate for the rest of the day because you're just smoked after that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> stim. Uh, I like it for, well, there's different kinds of stim, right? So that's this is where it gets kind of tricky. So yeah. the traditional tens that everybody knows about, you know, where it's just for pain. Yeah. I only really use that like, like right after like a surgery or an injury, just to like, if somebody's in like a ton of pain and they just can't, they can't even get comfortable just to give them a little bit of relief. But yeah, once you're past that acute phase, like after 21 days or so after the injury or a sore surgery, like I, I don't really use it anymore for that purpose. Um, I use a lot of neuromuscular reeducation post injury or post surgery, like after one of those. Um, that's a different style of stim. Um, and then, you know, like, like neural, neural reeducation is probably the biggest one I use it for. Um, so like, like with you, like when you're, you your quad was atrophied from being like non weight bearing for a while, like doing that Russian style or the neural re is huge for getting that contraction back in that quad. Yeah. So I'll use that until I get it. How about uh massage? Love it. I mean, you so, know me like manual for me is all everything I do and massage is like a, a portion of it, but yeah, like massage is great. Like going to a masseuse who specializes in massages. What's the benefit of that? Uh, I think it's more for, again, post-workout, flushing out all like the, the metabolic waste from training. You know, if, the, if there's a knot in there, getting it to calm down a little bit. So you get normal contractility of the muscle, right? So if, if you have a trigger point or a knot in that muscle, it can't lengthen or shorten as much as it should, which is going to impede your performance days after. So if you can get that to kind of calm down and make sure that, that muscle has as, as much pliability and mobility as it should, and I think, it, I think it's great. Gotcha. Um, dry needling. Love it, but I'm not supposed to do it here in New York. We're one of the five states that don't allow it. So I mean, I got certified in it like five years ago, um, hoping that New York would turn itself around. Um, you know, it's just we're one of those. It's one of those things. It's a political thing with the acupuncturists kind of fighting it here. So hopefully one day it switches. But yeah. So what that is, I know I could probably say it. Um, it I know you may. I don't know if your hands are tied, but. So acupuncturists make a lot of money with being able to do that in their office, right? 
with the needling in general. It's funny because if you ask an acupuncturist um, if they do dry needling, they don't because it's a totally different philosophy. So acupuncturists believe in chi and meridian lines and you know, they'll, they'll put a needle in your ear to help your kidney function or whatever it is they've gotten. I, I, and believe me, I don't really, I don't poo poo acupuncture. I've had it done to me a couple of times and I think there is something to it. Um, and to me, if something's been around for a few millennia, it has to have something to it. I know Western medicine can't really explain it per se, but it's been around for a long time for a reason. So it does, it must work. Yeah. So their philosophy is different. Dry needling is, it was born out of trigger point needling. So people that would get like trigger point injections for a knot and that kind of thing. They found that just by inserting the needle without injecting any kind of fluid, you got this twitch response in the muscle, which relaxed the trigger point. So dry yeah. needling was born out of that. So it was, it's a bit different philosophy, but yeah, most acupuncturists don't even do it. So the fact that they fight it to me is a little silly, but. I, I mean, so they don't want physical therapists to do it because it would take some clients away from it. Is that kind yeah. of the, the yeah, deal? Yeah, pretty much. That? Gotcha. Yeah. Is, is there other states besides New York that it's illegal in? Yeah, California, um, New York, uh, New Jersey allowed it, which is where I took the course in to get certified. And now they revoked it from their physical therapists. Um, Hawaii doesn't allow it. And there's like one other, but like 45 to 50 states say PTs can do it. The American Physical Therapy Association says PTs can do it. The Federation of State Board says PTs can do it. But for whatever reason, New York State decided it's not within our scope of practice. It sounds like every every state that has these crazy vaccine mandate laws <laughs> are the same states that don't let yeah, dry happen. So- sounds a lot like it, doesn't what it? What are they doing? Has they got the money? <laughs> uh, it's got to be. You know, it's, somebody's pocket didn't get lined. So, you know, I was like, who do I have to, you know, I'll take a petition. I'll collect 20 grand. Whose pocket do I got to put this in? Like, let me do it. Come on. Yeah, it's freaking ridiculous. Uh Hey, adjustments. So getting, getting your neck adjusted. Okay. Um, has its place. Um, again, you know, physical therapist's version of it is a little bit different than chiropractors. Um, you know, chiropractors believe in what's called the subluxation theory. So by manipulating your thoracic vertebrae, we can make your knee feel better. And by manipulating this vertebrae, we might make your liver function better. Physical therapy. It's well, Do you, you believe can't... in that at all? No, I don't. Um, okay. Uh, to me, it's, you know, if you can't turn your head to the left, because one of the facet joints is locked up, I'll try to manipulate it so that it moves properly and, and restore your motion. And then we tend to reinforce what we just did with that manipulation with corrective exercise to make sure it stays, whereas chiropractors tend to crack you and they pat you on the back and you go home. Yeah. So when you when you crack a neck, it's what is it just air bubbles inside your neck that are like being dispersed when yeah, it's, it gets cool. moved? The, the cracking is called a cavitation, which is the sound of a gas exchange in the joint. Um, but what it does do and why everybody feels so good when you have it done is your body releases an endogenous opiate response to the area. So your body actually produces its own version of like opiates. So when you do that manipulation, a broad area around it now has this pain relieving factor. So when you get your neck cracked, or your back cracked, you're like, oh my God, it feels so good. And it feels good for like a day. And then like the next day, you're kind of back to where you're at. hundred percent. 100% yeah. is exactly what happens. And I'm like, oh my God, you just want someone to be with you all the time. To yeah, be able just to crack constantly like, crack it. Just, There's something called a refractory period. So it once you crack a joint, you can't get that cavitation again for like about 20 minutes or so. It takes some time for the, the gas pressure to build back up again. Oh. So that's well, one, what it's I, like you. I mean, it's kind of like knuckles. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, you probably got thing. about 20 minutes until I can crack that again. Yeah, exactly. It's every joint in the body. Um, so remember when, when you, uh, you freaked out a little bit with your foot a while ago with the tendon, right? And you said you like, yeah, you heard like a yeah, pop. Yeah. I tried to I explain to you, like, if you do it with your knuckle, like one time, that's a joint popping, yeah. you know, may or may not be a problem. If you can do it rep- repeatedly and it's constantly kind of clicking and cracking, like your ankle snap when you're walking, yeah. that's tendon snapping over bone. So that's how you can tell the difference between whether it's a joint making a noise or it's a, it's a tendon issue. Is there any, is there any negatives of, of having joint manipulation done? I don't think so. Uh, you know, some people would argue that there is, that maybe it makes the ligaments around the joint a little more lax. Therefore, like there's less stability in the joint. But um, as far as like causing arthritis, that's been proven to be not true. So it makes sense because when you have a stiff neck, you're locked up. So everything's very tight. So if you want to keep it that way, just don't adjust. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, you know, those like you ever go to a chiropractor and they have these like clicky things mm-hmm. where they go click, click. Click, click. Yeah. And now, now like, let's see how strong you are. You should be stronger. You know, they do the before and after <laughs> test. What do you think yeah. of that stuff? Is any of that stuff have any real like basis of like through science? Does any of that possibly work? Well, yes, it has basis through science and how it works, but is it a lasting effect? No. So what is that? 
So that tool is called a JCAT. It's a chiropractic adjustment tool. So a, the technical term for a manipulation or the cracking is a, is a HVLAT, a high velocity, low amplitude thrust. So what that tool does is, is it causes a high velocity, low amplitude thrust at a much smaller scale, something that somebody that couldn't respond to a, an actual cracking. If actually. anybody doesn't know, this is basically what it looks like. It's a pen with the little <laughs> clicky thing. It's like <laughs> click, 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 yeah. click. And then they take my arm and they're like, see how much stronger you are now? Yeah. It's <laughs> and I'm like, like uh, yeah, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> remember remember the power balance bands back in the day? Oh, yeah. The, oh, the yeah. hologram on the go. Well, yep, test I, it. I, I bought all in. I bought a box of like a thousand of them. I was selling the people. I thought it was the greatest thing ever until I saw that Kentucky study that showed how wrong it was where they blindfolded people. They put a band on them and then put a wristband over the top. And they did all the different tests. And but you didn't know if you had the Lance Armstrong live band on, uh, live strong band on, or you had the hologram band on. It turned out it was the same reaction for everybody. Cause what it boils down to is it's a it's a motor learning principle. So when you do the test with nothing on you, it's the first time your body goes through it and you, know, you can't hold anything up. Yeah. And they do it again. It doesn't matter what's on your wrist, you're gonna be able to hold your arm up the second time because your body learned that that's an outside stimulus and we have to adjust to it. Yeah. So it was a marketing ploy. So with those, with those things, when they tap on a muscle belly, the tapping part of it is actually very scientific, whether it's with that tool or if it's your hand. When someone has a stroke uh, and they can't contract their muscle, a way to get them to start to get the contraction back is by slowly tapping. It's called tapotment on the muscle belly. It actually causes a stimulus enough to get those neurons to fire and get the, and to get the uh, muscle fiber to fire. If you don't do it consistently, then they won't be able to move their arms. Like when you go to somebody who does those things and they're tapping everywhere and all of a sudden you have a better contraction, it's just the nature of them tapping that muscle belly to get more recruitment. But if you don't train afterwards, it goes away and you got to keep tapping that muscle belly to get everything to move again. So, yeah. I mean, also if like, it's, this is another little pet peeve I have with physical therapists. And I know you'll, I know you understand where I'm coming from. They always ask how you feel afterwards. And as, as you know, you don't want to, you feel bad because especially if they're very confident that you feel better, mm -hmm. you feel like you have to say, I feel a little bit better. I and mean, then, like do you, I, you have to notice this happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, at least like, I appreciate when, when you and I work together, you're like, nah, I don't feel any different. And I, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I need that. And, the, and the, there's a reason why we ask that it's because it's a test retest kind of principle. Right. So like, I, I, I assume I hypothesize that this thing is going to make you feel a bit better. So I ask you, and if it didn't, then I have to adjust and, and do something different or, or modify what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, when people say, yeah, yeah I feel good, it, it, it's because they don't want to make us feel bad or whatever it is. It kind of gives us a false sense of what we did was working for them. So then they come back and they're like, how you feeling? Nah, I'm kind of where I was at before. Well, did you lie about how you felt afterwards before? Or did you really feel good? Yeah. Um, you know, like, right, like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So like if, if I manipulate your neck and you tell me you feel good, and then every time you come back and do the same thing, but you don't get any better. So it's kind of like a, a lose-lose for both of us because you didn't want to make me feel bad about it, but I didn't adjust my treatment to actually make you feel any better. Yeah. You just so like it, it is kind of necessary, but then you get like those guys that are so high on themselves. They're like, everything I do, I touch and everything's fixed. Like, how do you feel now? And it's like, uh, the same. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the energy they come at you with. If yeah. they come at you with this undefeated energy where they're just like, you feel great, right? Feel right, great. right. Yeah, you feel like a million bucks. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel amazing. Thank it's you almost so like much. hypnotizing you to say yeah. So they just never coming back here again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like you get a terrible haircut and they show <laughs> they got the yep. mirror in the back of your head, it's all butchered. It's like it looks amazing, man. I never seen so fresh. <laughs> I've never told a barber that my they did a bad job. No, ever in my can't. life. Have you? Can't. No, never. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good. And I go home, I just shave my head. I'm like, Fuck, I know. That was a I'm like, you <laughs> bastard, you suck. But I can never say it to their face. No, you don't want to, you don't want to embarrass them. Man. No, that's make terrible. Feel bad, but you just right, let's go, go to the next. Again. Okay, I, you know, I, I'm actually going to ask you about uh, Al, Al, the Alboa techniques. Aldoa, love Aldoa. it. Aldoa, I could. Is yeah. it Aldoa? Aldoa, yeah. Aldoa. Bro, I say this wrong yeah. every single time. I switch it up. I'll say Aldoa, Alboa. I, yeah, I it's Eldoa, created Eldoa. by that same French osteopath that I take those courses from. Guy oh, good idea. Okay. Eldoa. Yeah, um, it's fascial stretching, fascial normalization. It's 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 hard. Like if you do it right, like it's it is not easy to do. Is it? The, is this part of it? This one where you come up and then you come down and you twist your arms and then yeah, that that's one of the motions. Um, when you would do that, you would actually probably be sitting with your feet out in front of you, so you're trying to get a complete dural stretch for like all that. 
um, fascia up the spine and everything. Yeah. So when I'm doing like this, I'm trying to stretch the nerves out as far as I can at the fingertips come up mm -hmm. and then I'm doing, I'm just turning my head back and forth. And you're rotating because then what that's doing is it's actually flossing the nerves in their, in their path, in their channel. It's getting the fascia to move a certain way. Yeah. So it's very specific as to like where to lock out your joints and where to move and how to move. And, you know, I've taken a couple of courses on it. Um, and I personally can't do it because I'm so damn tight. So I just get frustrated, but you I can't do, do feel, that. You can't do it. No, nah, man, I can't like half Which the part, stuff. You, is it the one when you have your feet on the wall that you're trying to get hard. your lower? What's that? Yeah. Well, that one's super hard for me. You try to get your butt against the wall, your legs flat against the wall, your low back flat against the yes. wall. You bring your hands up behind you. You accidentally rotate the arms. Yeah. Like I, I just feel everything's on fire, which probably means I need to do it. But I just <laughs> now, how long? How long would you hold that stretch for? I, so I think it varies, but it, it is longer than most people think. It's got to be at least forty-five seconds, to like a minute and a half. Like it's not like a quick little ten seconds. Oh yeah, movement. that's that's a pain. Yeah. yeah, that's a hard work. That's a workout. Right that, you're sweating after that when you're just stretching yourself out. I mean, people at home could give it a shot. Like, it's crazy, but you do feel. I've done it a few times, and I and I do want to actually get on a protocol with doing it the right way. Yeah, because I do think with my neck and, and the neck issues I've had, it's worth trying to stretch Absolutely. this out and getting the nerves moving better. You know, and even like the so there's the thing called the dural matter that's like in your you know your spinal column that like lines the spinal cord. That's got to have adhesions all over from the surgeries you've had and everything else. Like, and this is meant to like get all that moving again and make sure that the fluid moves properly. And all right, hyperbaric chambers, love it. Really good for healing. You know, wound care, um, anything else that's like that needs to heal in your body. It's amazing. Uh, red light therapy, garbage, garbage. <laughs> yeah. Well, doctor, doctor Uberman is uh, starting to. He, he, it's good for the eyes. I seen him put something out about that. Yeah. Really so I should, I should, I should backtrack that. It's good for some things. Like it's supposed to be really good for your skin, scar healing, that kind of stuff. Other than that, like, do I think the lights like penetrating four centimeters deep into your tendons and everything? Like, I, I don't know. The verdict's out on that one. Gotcha. But like, definitely scar therapy, like that kind of stuff. Energy, like maybe extra energy. Maybe you know, they claim that it's you know increasing red blood cell production and like getting the mitochondria firing. I hope um, Ray Longo listens to this because he thinks red light therapy is an everyday thing for him. He does it every <laughs> single night, and what he thinks it does well, the guy's for him, skin's beautiful. I mean, it must be working. Look at the guy; he looks like he he's thinks, forty something years old. He thinks it's getting rid of his gray hairs. And, he, I mean, and it's stopping him from bolding. It may be. I mean, they that is it what he's using it for. He literally sits his head up to it for like 20 minutes every single day. They claim it does. So, I mean, maybe it does. The guy's got a full head of hair. I mean, I'm bald and he's a little bit older than I am. So maybe it's working for him. I don't know. Yeah. yeah he's, he's definitely had some surgeries done. to look that good. There's no way that's natural. I'm just kidding. I, I, I can't hate on him. He really does have beautiful hair for and an skin. older guy. I mean, yeah, for an older guy, he's not, you know, not a wrinkle on him, you know? <laughs> He's the godfather. Yeah. Um, Norma Tech sleeves. Love them. Love, Love them. them. For post-workout, like, to, again, to flush all that kind of metabolic waste from training, that kind of so thing. So Norma Tech sleeves, just so everybody out there who has no idea what we're talking about here, um, those are those big old, like, things that athletes put on their legs that blows up and it compresses the legs and helps with – Inflammation, yeah, circulation, circulation, inflammation. We use it a bit in our in our clinic for people like that have a lot of swelling after surgery, that kind of thing, because um, it does. You know, it, it works on what's called peristaltic compression, right? So it, it squeezes the foot, then the calf. Let's go with the foot, squeezes the knee. Let's go with the knee, squeezes the thigh. So it's kind of like flushing all that stuff, or like you know, the arm, whatever you're working on. So it flushes all towards the lymphatic trunks and gets rid of like a lot of that swelling. So it's definitely very good. All right. Well, I got them. I like them. Uh, I know the, comp the Compex. I like it for a bunch of things, yeah. For strengthening, right, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and that's one of those. It's another type strong of strong stim unit, right? Yeah, it's a strong stim unit. You know, it gets like for neuromuscular reeducation. You know, for like you know working on atrophy or uh, you know lack of contraction. But it's also really good for flushing lactic acid out after like a hard workout. Like it just gets that con that constant pumping going and it pushes all the kind of crap out of the muscle. Um. How about this? Co the copper knee pads that, you know, those copper like mm -hmm. knee sleeves that people wear? Mm -hmm. Garbage. Definitely garbage. Definitely garbage. Dude, it's, like, placebo, it's like the hologram. Placebo effect matter? It's like the hologram. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, placebo effect, sure. That's a real documented thing. It definitely works. Yeah. But like, you know, it's like the hologram. Do you think that a hologram is really like re you know, energizing your body's natural magnetic balance? I can get out of here. Have you looked into the copper band things at all? Like even what they're saying they're doing? Do you? 
Yeah, I mean, they claim like it's, you know, negatively charging the ions in the body, which is to help with your frequency. Or I mean, I don't know how much I really buy into that. I'm with you on that sh- stuff too. Like the the ion, when you start talking about ions and stuff in the body and we're controlling it with things, um, I do I, I do t- seem to uh, turn my head on that one. I, yeah. I, it's hard for me to like. Really now the brace it. by itself, it's a good compression brace and, it, you know, kind of holds the joint feeling. So maybe it just makes you feel good because it's like really tight around the joint. But, you know, is it is it really doing anything other than like a so regular neoprene sleeve like, like a guy who has a guy who has arthritis in his knee he's 55 60 years old um what what would you say is the best thing for him to do move it he's not getting ca- surgery not nope. getting surgery his knees just got arthritis move uh it's the best keep, thing for keep you moving to keep moving with low impact right so whether it's like riding a bike or just like easy walking you got to keep that fluid in the joint constantly moving. So it seems counterintuitive, right? Like you have arthritis, it hurts to move. You're like, Sh- I shouldn't move. The problem though, is that by not moving, you're trapping some of that older fluid in there and it's, it's getting kind of like gunked up. It's like, it's not as like um, vibrant as it should be. So you moving the joint flushes the old crappy fluid out, like an oil change, puts the new fluid in, keeps the joint lubricated. That fluid actually is nutrition for the joint too. So it keeps the, the, the health, the joint kind of vibrant by not moving. You're just basically making everything worse. Yeah. But you got to be uh, careful. Have, have you, you, you hear the knees over toes guy? I have. Yeah. Hear, what, what do you think of him and, uh, and what he's doing? Um, I, I agree with a lot of his principles. Like, like for some reason, like, you know, people think putting your knees over your toes has become like this God awful sin, but it's like, you know, it's a natural occurrence. Like walking down the stairs, your knee, your knees have to go over your toes. Otherwise you got to walk down like backwards or like sideways. Yeah. Like it has to happen. Yeah. Where I, I fall off a little bit is I, you know, I don't know much about his background. I think he's like a, an actor or something like that. So he doesn't have any real schooling in this stuff on anatomy and physiology and human pathology and disease processes. So um, I'm a little skeptical, but like, I like some of the principles he does for yeah. sure. Um, like the, like building the front of your leg, the tibialis muscle, the, so mm-hmm. you know, that like basically the muscle that long, runs along the side of your shin. Yes. Um, he really emphasizes the importance of that. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, he's not wrong. You know, it's, it's a, it's a muscle that we tend to like, let go. Like we just kind of like, that's where you get your shin splints when that muscle is too weak and it can't combat the pull from the other side of the leg, which is your calf. So it, it does the opposite movement of the calf muscle. Um, I'd say more often than not, people have a serious weakness in that muscle and it causes problems with balance later on. It causes problems, with everything else. I have um, terrible weakness there. And I don't know if it's because of, uh, Motion issues in the ankle, like just my both my ankles, just they're like, tight, just naturally move. tight. I think they don't move, they're not injured, but they're just tight. And um, so when I first started trying to do those exercises where you sit your back, you ever do that? Those exercises where you put your back up against the wall, standing up, and you put your feet a little bit away from the wall, mm-hmm. and you try to bring your toes up, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, for like sets. I am, and then the next step once you get strong enough doing that would be to take one foot off and that's up in the air, and the other ones just kind of do it on their own. So all your weights on one foot doing it. Yeah, I literally could barely get my toes off the ground. It's embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm kind of with you on that. Mine, mine is as strong as it should be, especially after my neck injury and I had like drop foot and everything, and you know, I didn't do the greatest rehab. <laughs> so yeah. like I've that one's pretty weak on me, but it's it's definitely an important muscle, you know. And, he, and again, he's not wrong with that, you know. So. Yeah. I don't know enough about it to really make a complete comment, but if some of the stuff yeah. I see, like I'm with him on like you sh- with, I'm with him on the fact that you have to have your knees go over your toes at some point in time. You look at like any indigenous population. Um, they're, they're in that full deep squat position, washing their clothes in the river. Like their knees are over their toes and they're some of the healthiest joints compared to most of humanity. Um, so it sucks. I'd just be dead by now. My, the osteophytes, <laughs> the osteophytes behind my knee. I can't yeah. sit in those positions, bro. Yeah, I can't no even take a dump can. the old fashioned way. You know, they just sit in those squatty positions, so relaxed, and take dumps. There's no wiping yeah. needed because it just flawlessly just comes right out, out of butt cheeks. Just <laughs> you, gotta, you, you gotta get that squatty potty. It's like the my the, sister the has it, and I was yeah. so pissed I didn't use it. It was it was by the toilet, and she didn't tell me about it until after I got done taking my dump. I was like, <laughs> she's like, oh, did you use it? I was like, are you freaking kidding me? After she explained it to me, I was so pissed off I didn't get to try it. Yeah, dude, they're in like they're in Costco potty for potty. like uh, two of them for like twenty five bucks. You can get yourself a pair there. Have you been using a squatty potty? I should. But have you I used one, one before? I have, yeah. What'd you it think? Definitely, it definitely helps. Like, you know, instead of like, you know, just put your knees up in a good position so it's everything just kind of comes straight like out. Less like less wiping? Yeah, yeah. My less. sister says like there's no wiping needed. There's That's like it. no need to because like everything, it's just like a straight shot. <laughs> she said the only reason why um, this hasn't been around for a while is that the toilet paper companies have been 
have been putting a lot of money towards not letting people know about this. I can see that. You know, I just made that up completely, but I think I can see that. I, I can like see that. It makes sense. You know, think about it like anything else. Like, you know, big oil doesn't want the electric cars out there and everything else. Yeah. Like, all right. I, I'd buy into that. I know. I know. I know. I don't, I, I believe in anything at this point. <laughs> um, let me move this down. That's going to be the last one. Um, uh, shockwave. Oh, you know, I love that, brother. You, know you like shockwave. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do. For, for a lot of things, not for everything, you know. Um, you know, I've just seen great results with it with different ailments, especially stuff like tendonitis. Is like, uh, I had this woman who's a, a triathlete who for like 20 some odd years has been dealing with this like chronic Achilles tendonitis. And no matter what she did, grasping, taping, scraping, cupping, stretching, she just couldn't. She just constantly had this tendonitis going on. It like it would impede her triathletes, her triathlon season. Then three sessions of the shockwave, I did literally nothing else other than that. And she's like, it's gone for good. Like it doesn't hurt her anymore. Wow. Um, so, you know, I, and I've seen that, I, you know, I've seen it work immediately. It feels on like it works when yeah. I do it. You know, you got like, immediate range of emotion with it, but you know, the question is yeah. how long does that stay? Like, I don't know. I didn't really see you much after that. You went back home after that, but that was a is, great set. That was a great session last oh, time I was in New York. It was like, we were up there for like two hours, man. We just did everything. We just crushed I gotta everything. get your ass back. I got to get you come down to South Carolina. The land Say the word, free, bro. Say the word. I'll come down. We're going to do that. Um, PRP. It has its place for certain things. Um, a lot of the research is uh, favorable for like, again, tendon issues, soft tissue type of stuff. Um, I don't think it works so hot on joints, but. Gotcha. Um, you said hyperbaric chambers you liked, right? And yep. we just kind of yep. skipped over that. I, I like that. Um, ART, active release therapy. Yep. That, that kind of, that's like coupled in the whole manual therapy thing for me. So, you know, I don't have when I do my manual therapy, I don't just do one thing. I kind of mix 10 different things into one session. So I, I like, I like most manual therapy techniques. I think it's a, gotcha. a safe way and, to say. And, and what the nerve gliding one, what's the name for that one? Is there, that's a technique, right? It is nerve glides. Yep. Or nerve flossing. They call it too. Okay. So nerve flossing. What's your thoughts yeah. on that? It definitely works. Somebody who's uh, well, a like someone like you, combat sports, where you're just like, or even a contact sport in general, where you're just taking like shots, at different parts of the body. Like you're going to build up, adhesions to different areas so like by getting that that nerve should be able to move in its channel back and forth and if it's stuck and it can't move if there's like a space where there's an adhesion or it's stuck up at a joint somewhere you're going to get an increased stretch which is going to cause like the numbness and tingling so like it, people that have like radiculopathy like symptoms like from their neck or they have like numbness down the arm the, the flossing or even their leg for like sciatica flossing it plays a huge role and kind of again it's calmed down How about cupping uh, i like it sometimes um, I don't use it in the traditional sense. We you know the uh, Eastern medicine believes bringing like bad blood to the surface and you're decongesting an area and all this sort of stuff. I use it for uh, negative pressure. So say you have like a trigger point on like your trap and like me digging in there is miserable. Like you keep squirming away, you push my hand away, you want me to stop. So people that can't handle that. I use cupping for that where I'll, instead of pushing on the, the, the area, I try to lift the skin and the fascia away from it. And it'll just, maybe that muscle underneath gets a chance to calm down a little bit. That's what I use it for. Gotcha. Uh, all right. So one, one, so you obviously, you work with everybody, all different sorts of walk of life, but I feel like at this point you really specialize in the fight worlds. Yeah. Like how did, how did you, did that happen because you wanted to work with fighters or just happened randomly? How did that end up happening? Kind of a combo. Um, when I was in school, um, like I said, when I, when I was in the city working for that guy, Gary, like we had a lot of pro athletes from all different sports. We had famous actors, actresses, singers, but I knew I was moving back to Long Island and I know that there's not a whole lot of pro athletes that live on Long Island, but I knew uh, that. What? Yeah, well, that's where I'm finishing. I know that there's a lot. The fighting is a, is a huge, like Long Island seems to be like a microcosm for like great fighters because wrestling is so huge here, right? You have section 11 in Suffolk County, you have section eight in Nassau. And like, it just produces these awesome I miss, wrestlers. I miss it. Don't you do this. I know. I know. Don't you do I'm, this. I'm, I'm going to get myself an egg sandwich here and I'm going to get a slice of pizza and just show you what you're missing, my man. But yeah, so like, I know, I know that, you know, after wrestling, there's nowhere really to go. So we, we just produce a ton of combat sports athletes. So I was like, all right, if I want to work with pro athletes. It's going to have to be them. Um, you know, and I wrestled and then I started getting into jujitsu shortly after that. And um, so I was like, all right, whatever, whatever can make me more um, appealing to the, the fight guys, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And, and because I was involved in combat sports and everything else, it kind of just, it kind of clicked a little bit. And then, you know, guys started coming to me and like, 
other therapists will tell you, well, just don't train this week. Whereas I'm like, well, I understand you. Well, why don't you just stay away from half guard? Why don't you stay away from knee shield? Don't do a butterfly guard this week and you can do everything else. Like, okay, cool. So it just, it, I understand the language a bit more where traditional PTs maybe don't. So it just helped me kind of click. And, you know, Manji was pushing you on me forever. And then once I started treating you, then other guys were coming and Al and Aljo. And so it kind of just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. What do you, what do you make of like the fighters? Like when, when a normal person comes up to you and is like, wow, you work with all these fighters. Like, what's that like? What are these, what's it like working with these fighters? And what's your answer to that? Um, I, I like it because you guys are like, most of my job is dialing you guys back. Like, like, well, Hey, why don't you back off of this this week? Instead of like trying to get you to do one exercise. I'm like, why don't you cut three of those out this week? Or like, you know, take like, you know I, I, like, I know this was not the case with Volante. Well, no, he was. The, the, <laughs> yeah, no, he was. I'm clipping. I'm going to clip this part. Let's let's just throw trash on him. I'm clipping uh, this and send it to him. It's the only I, part of my podcast. I had, to, ever I had to, to beg Jesus to put socks on for a workout, let alone actually get the workout in. So oh my <laughs> gosh, bro, we're going to talk about your strength and conditioning, your 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 big debut uh, UFC fighter. <laughs> Listen, his, his first fight with me worked. We dropped like 40 pounds. He was the fittest he's ever been as far as cardio. I don't know what happened in that fight, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, you, but, can't, uh, you can't do any, everything for him, but oh my no. gosh, that last one, what, what was he looking like? Oh, I just think I don't think he cared. <laughs> yeah, he definitely didn't <laughs> he care. He was just like, Oh, I'm gonna collect a paycheck, I'll you know, hang out with the boys one more time, and uh, I'll pull the day. <laughs> I know. All right, let's let's forget about Volante for yeah. now because I'm taking yeah. you off track of you being sincere about fighters in a yeah. positive no, way. No, so you guys, what I like about you guys is like, you're like, you don't want to be perfect, you're just make it so I can train tomorrow. Just make it so I can fight Saturday night. You're not like, whereas you get like, you know, um, you know, the soccer mom who's like claims they're dying because they got this little thing in their neck and they just, it's ruining their lives. I'm like, you have any, these guys are walking around with broken bones, blood pouring out every pore. Like, and then all they want to do is make it so like their shoulder can move an extra two inches today. Like, that's why I like working with the fighters. They're just like a tougher breed of people. And yeah, they don't, they know they're not going to be perfect. They just want to make, they want me to be able to get them to the point where they just feel a little more comfortable so they can perform properly. So it's tell like, me they're not, they, tell me the fighters aren't just the most humble group of guys. Too, that was right? my next thing. Honestly, like the most down to earth, like there's not a, besides, besides me, butt. everybody else. No, well, you're, you're, pretty, Mr., you're Mr. Hollywood, but everybody nah, else. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, honestly, like the most down to earth, like give you the shirt off their back type of people. Like, um, they're just like it's the ideal person for me to work with really. Yeah. How do you, how do you uh, like juggle these up and coming UFC fighters or MMA fighters where, you know, they don't really have that much money. They're just trying to, you know, they're broke as hell. Mm -hmm. They're in the grind, trying to make it, you know, doing side jobs. How do you juggle where you, you kind of have to give away some money to try to help out these guys that, you know, are going to be special one day. Yeah, you know, you do it in hopes that when they do make it, they'll do right by you. You know, there's no guarantee, right? Like, yeah. you know, so if some of the guys I train now, some of the Bellator up and comers, the CFFC guys, I don't charge them my full hourly rate because I know they can't afford it. But I know like that, like you know, they're going to be something special, and hopefully they'll keep me with them once they're in the yeah. limelight, and they'll keep me as their PT or their strength coach, and maybe they'll have me corner them, and they'll just kind of keep things going, and then it'll all paid off, but. You know, there's no guarantee. They could very well just ditch me once they make it big and go pick up the the biggest name guy they could find. It is what it is. Do but. you do you feel like uh like even having them though, having these up and coming fighters and fighters in general help with marketing you towards the normal people too? Where like, wow, this guy actually trains UFC fighters and MMA fighters, and this guy and that guy. Does it help you? Like just with normal customers, yeah, want to get in with you. It does, and because you know the whole social media thing, which you know in the beginning. I hate being like, look at me, look who I'm with, look what I'm doing. But like, it, it does, like I'd say 25% or more of my client base is from social media. And it's because I post pictures with you and I Quinta and all these guys and like, look who I'm working with. And so people that, even if they're just a fan, they're like, oh, he must know what he's doing if he's keeping them fighting. So my, my ankle hurts, I'm going to go to that guy. So it definitely helps. Yeah, I, I would assume so. Um All right. I think we're good, bro. This is over, nice. it's over 45 minutes. That's and good. uh we started late so i appreciate you doing this man i appreciate you uh, having me, man. it was awesome i'm trying to think if there was anything is there any, anything any shout outs that you want to give um you could do it now no nah, i mean you know just the missus you know thanks for letting me do my thing i'm, I'm out of the house a lot 
she puts up with my my uh, my demeanor. You know, at the end of the day, after dealing with you know ten hours worth of people and their problems, I'm, my, half of my job is being like a psychotherapist too. You know, I listen to everybody's their marital problems and their kids and their job. And then, so when I get home, I have like zero empathy left, and I feel bad for her because she's the last person I want to screw over when it comes to that kind of stuff. But I'm just like yeah. I'm smoked. But she knows this is what I want to do. And you know, when I go away with like G for the fights, or I or I, or I court Adam in his last one in Vegas, like she knows like this is like. I don't want to say my passion because to me, passion is fleeting. Whereas like love is more like a long standing kind of thing. This is what I want to do. And these are the people I want to work with and it's where I want my career to go. And so she's very supportive and, you know, let me, what's her name again? Jenna. When Jenna, when you come home and you're tired, you're beat up and say, Oh man, it was a long day. And the kids, you know, kids are there. You got to help out the kids and you want her to feel bad for you because you had a long work day. And then she looks at you and she's like, you don't work. You love what you do. <laughs> you, you, you do what you love. You're not yeah. working. Honestly, I, I, my whole life's been like that. Really. I, I've never had a Sunday I'm morning. I don't wake up on Sunday. Like, oh God, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. Crap. It's Monday. I've, I've never really had, even when I was teaching, I never really had that. I mean, it was maybe a little more so when I was teaching, especially in Bushwick, Brooklyn, but, but like, you know, since I've been a strength guy and a, and a PT guy, like I, I really love what I do, which is why I don't mind working 70 hours a week. Cause to me, it's not work. Like I'm, I'm having fun. I'm talking, I'm helping people. And it's, you know, it's good. Is it hard but, juggling with the juggling with family life? It is. Um, I, I tend to be a bit of a workaholic. Like I, even as far as like taking care of myself, like I'll, I'll skip my own workout on a Monday morning at 10 AM. If like you called me and said, Hey, can I come at 10 30? Yep. I'll be there. No problem. Instead of be like, no, that's my workout time. Like I, I tend to yeah. give up some things to go work with people. And well, um, that's why luckily, you're successful. It takes sacrifice. You it know? does. It does. Um, luckily, my kids are really young right now, so I'm not missing out on any like sports yet. And they're just starting to get into that kind of stuff. So it's going to yeah. be a real challenge the next couple of years. But the weekends are going to I'll find a way to, to make it work. To them. Yeah. That's my struggle too. It's like I don't want to be traveling too much and stuff. I want to be able to be at my kids' sporting events and yeah. don't want to miss that stuff. So no, nah, I don't. I don't want to be that dad who was like never around or you know. Mm. All of a sudden, my kids like, oh, you never came to a game. Like I don't. I don't want to be. I want to be at every one. Uh, I mean, I may I, not coach a ton, but I got to be at every game. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you, bro. Yeah. yeah, that means a lot to me too. Yeah. All right, brother. I appreciate you doing this, man. All right, dude. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for Take having care, me. Take care, bro. And let's uh, let's. Uh, I need to get you out here soon. Just say the Maybe word. For like a week. Just get me going. Yeah, let's do it. I'll get come down. All right, brother. Just, All right. Crush it six hours a day. You'll, you'll be like 100% in a week and a half. Uh, that would be amazing. All right, buddy. We're going to do that. All right, Here brother. Yep, All take right, care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please let us know in the comments below. Won't Back Down is also available as a podcast, so feel free to give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts.